It's June 28th, 1746, and another remarkable event is about to be uncovered by Aria, Rebecca, and Ali, the Retrospectors. He was born Charles Edward Louis John Casimir Sylvester Severino Maria Stewart. His <laughs> friends called him Bonnie Prince Charlie. But on this day, he was an Irish spinning maid called Betty Burke as he made his famous escape over the sea to sky in a disguise not exactly fit for a king. Yes, he was dressed in a calico gown, a quilted petticoat and a headdress. He was in drag. Uh, but there was a good reason for this, although apparently he did enjoy dressing up and had spent some time in the French court going to uh, mass balls, etc. in various costumes. Uh, but there was an imperative for this which was he had a £30,000 bounty on his head this is in 1746 money (laughs) so he was highly wanted and that's for the not entirely untreasonous intention of toppling the monarchy. Yeah, so Charlie uh, pretty much thought that the British throne belonged to him and was his birthright. And so he had planned to invade Great Britain along with his Jacobite followers and remove the Hanoverian usurper, in his view, George II. And his aim was pretty simple. He was going to take the throne on behalf of his grandfather, the Roman Catholic convert James VII of Scotland and II of England and Ireland, that had been lost in 1688 to 90 to his nephew and son-in-law, William of Orange. Yes, him who starred in our recent episode, Don't Wear Orange. And the Scots actually backed him and wanted the Stuarts back. And they had been antagonised by King William's imposition of Presbyterianism, which was a pretty austere version of Protestantism that they didn't much like. So they backed Charles. And also they were still smarting from the Union of Scotland and England in 1707. Some people in Scotland still smarting from that. (laughs) That's true. (laughs) So even though the Stuarts themselves weren't particularly loved, the Union was even less popular. So they had this idea that, you know, if they back this, they get their independence back. Yeah, because when you say he believed it was his birthright, he had been brought up to believe it was his birthright. He was the royal family in exile. He was the grandson of King James the Seventh, And the Jacobites you referred to, that name, Jacobus is derived from the Latin form of James. There were a lot of people that wanted to restore the line to Scotland. Yeah, and I mean, so Charlie had grown up in exile in France and all he'd witnessed his whole life was his father, the deposed James Stuart, trying desperately to drum up support among Catholic Europe to seize the throne from the Protestant William and Mary. And in 1714, when Queen Anne had died childless and her random German cousin George I had arrived to take the throne, there was a lot of popular unrest, especially in Scotland. Everyone was like, who is this guy? And James Stuart had emerged and led these Jacobites in a short-lived rebellion. And after that, you know, he didn't really try again. But in July 1745, he'd landed in Scotland and set about trying to raise support from clan leaders. And actually, he did pretty well at the beginning because he, although he only had a few thousand men, the government forces were up in the highlands and in Venice, so he was able to march into Edinburgh without much opposition and actually got as far south as Derbyshire before they decided they had to turn around and consolidate at least their hold on Scotland. Yeah, because no one was necessarily expecting him to do this at this point. So he'd been in France waiting to invade the south of England. That had fallen through, the French had got cold feet, he'd been going to his mass balls, etc. <laughs> and then just thought... <laughs> Look, if I don't do this now, I'm never going to do this. You know, if I don't topple George II, if I wait till George III, that's really firmly established (laughs) the Germans as the new royal family. So he came up with this quite novel idea of starting in the north, gathering the support from the people who loved him in Scotland, and then gaining ground as they go down... Yeah, so he took Edinburgh pretty quickly. He also routed Sir John Cope, who was the head of the British armed troops at Prestonpans. And then they pushed down to Carlisle, where after a short bloodless siege, they were uh, successful there. And then they marched through Lancashire, gathering further support as they went. A bit. I mean, in total, they had like 300 Englishmen joined in, which is not, you know, it's not insubstantial because the army was only 6,000 or something. But also, I think he might have hoped for a little bit more than that. Hey, the Stuarts are back. Why yeah, three hundred people. Yeah, like, oh, we're looking a bit Scottish. Yeah. Mm, that's not yeah. great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so they got as far as Derby, one hundred and twenty miles from London, and it was at this point that the Scottish commanders were like, "Actually, I think it's time to turn around and go back." Yes, the British forces captured a French ship which was carrying money destined for the Jacobite army, so they lost some of their funding. Um, And then, interestingly, the Brits made it illegal to wear tartan in Scotland, which, again, seems like a throwback to our Don't Wear Orange episode, um, which was to do with the Highland clans (laughs) supporting the Jacobites. 
Which is just, I mean, imagine telling a Scotsman not to wear tartan. Like, there are still now some SNP politicians who would have nothing to wear if you said, don't wear tartan. Yeah, and the Jacobite Rebellion came to an incredibly brutal sudden end on the 16th of April 1746 near Inverness, where they were brutally defeated at the Battle of Culloden by the Duke of Cumberland's forces. And in the aftermath, Charles fled into the Highlands with government agents in hot pursuit. So for several weeks, he'd been island hopping, and he was sort of starting to proceed into the Inner Hebrides. And so June found him hiding out on the island of South Uist with the government net closing in on him. And also on the island at this time was Flora MacDonald, who was a 24-year-old woman from the neighbouring Isle of Skye. She was staying with the Lady of Clan Ranald on the island, which was controlled by a pro-government militia that was commanded by her stepfather, Hugh MacDonald. So it's not entirely clear what possessed her to assist Charlie, who he was obviously overseeing the hunt for, although one of the four companions with him, Captain O'Neill, was a distant relation of hers and acted as a go-between to him may have butted her up. Yeah, it is a bit unclear why she got involved in this, but either way, she managed to get permission from her stepfather, who was, as you say, the commander of the local militia, to travel from Uist to the mainland, accompanied by two servants and a crew of six boatmen. And this is where the disguise comes in. Though it's totally bonkers. Okay, so he dresses up as Betty Burke, an Irish spinning maid. Now, you can understand why a woman who is in her position needs a crew of six boatmen, but why did she need to take with her... Why did she need a spinning maid? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, is that a convincing... Oh, as soon as I get to the yeah. mainland, I'm going to need some new clothes made for me. So I need to take this very actually masculine looking woman with me <laughs> who keeps fiddling with her wig. Apparently, um, uh, Charlie just found it really uncomfortable and had to keep adjusting it as they went. But they did eventually manage to make it to a destination, though they didn't get to the mainland. They got to Sky uh, and they hid overnight in a cottage where they then made their way overland to Portree, where the prince was then able to get on a boat to the island of Rassi and from there back to France. I think there was some sympathy for him. I I think it must be that people had identified him on the ship or around the ship and couldn't really believe their eyes and thought it best to keep their feelings to themselves. I mean, if you say at that point, I've got him, there's going to be a lot of death around you very quickly, isn't there? That's the thing. Like, you know, people wanted him executed. People wanted anyone who had helped him to be put in the Tower of London, which ultimately is what happened briefly to Flora MacDonald. And maybe if you're just an ordinary Scot who's happy enough with the Hanoverians, you know, doesn't actively support this guy, but equally just doesn't want to get involved because doesn't really have any loyalty to either... Maybe you just let it pass. You're hoping a bit of plausible deniability. You're just like, oh, whoa, that spinning maid. No, yeah. uh, no even inclination that that was him. <laughs> it doesn't seem like he was particularly inconspicuous either. There's an account by a guy who travelled with him called Neil McKeegan, and he recounts that after they arrived at Sky, they were walking to the estate of some supporters, another family called McDonald, lots of McDonald's, as you may not be surprised to learn. And as they walked across the island to reach the estate, Betty hitched her skirt so high when they were crossing streams that it attracted (laughs) shock and amusement from locals and he had to be admonished to pick up his skirts in a more ladylike fashion well flora was later asked why she had uh, helped the rival to the throne um by prince frederick who was the son of george the second and she is reported to have replied it was no more than i would have done for your majesty had you been in like situation it's not clear whether he was touched by her words or whether he was mindful of her status in the region. She obviously belonged to quite a prominent family and her stepfather was a militia commander. But she was freed from the Tower of London without further punishment in 1747. And she became a bit of a celebrity when she returned to Scotland. One of her admirers was Samuel Johnson, who actually seems, frankly, a little bit too keen on her. He seems more like a, a little bit more like a stalker than a fan. And then her life only gets more exciting from there because she married a guy called Alan MacDonald, MacDonald again, and then because of her husband's debt in 1774, they emigrated to North Carolina and quickly got caught up in the American Revolution. And she and her family, like many Highlanders, took the side of the British and they lost pretty much everything. American rebels destroyed the family plantation, but she did actually manage to get on a ship with her daughter bound back for the island of Skye but on her way back she got (laughs) caught by pirates she returned to Skye and lived out the rest of her life there and legend said she requested to be buried in the sheet that Charlie had slept in that night they stayed on the Isle of Skye although uh, is that mm, another hint as as to why she might have helped him I think so he gave her a locket of his hair as well in his gratitude when he reached France which seems like quite a personal gift of his to have given (laughs) I mean you know 
He had access to money. The reason that we still remember this incident is from the Sky Boat song, because the song makes it sound like something very significant happened on the other side. But actually, he only stayed in Sky for one day, and then he carried on island hopping on his way to France. So it wasn't actually a particularly significant step in the journey. Carry the lad that's born to be king, dressed as an Irish spinning maid. <laughs> then he'll go and live in Rome and die a drunkard the end. <laughs> Tomorrow. He had supposedly confused one lighthouse for another, and so he accidentally ran the ship aground against the rocky coast. Love the show? Support the show. Patreon.com slash retrospectors. Part of the ACAST Creator Network.